uh, we are, we're honored to have uh, Margo Davis here. She is a uh, very well-known photographer, much honored, and uh, uh, you can uh, read her resume. And she has a special relationship to Antigua and uh, related islands, and she's going to talk about uh, work she's done there uh, for many years. So, Thank you, Richard. Margo. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out on this beautiful day. Why anyone would want to be in a neon lit conference room, but anyway, um, thank you. Um, so I thought I'd try to do a little bit of about four, three or four different things. One, just to try to give you a very sketchy history of Antigua in the Caribbean. I assume most people here know that it's not Antigua in Guatemala, the capital or the former capital of Guatemala, although even my gallerist in San Francisco excitedly called me up one day and said, oh, there's a whole beautiful Mayan market they're showing in the Chronicle on Antigua. And I wrote back and said, you've got the wrong demographics. Um, so a lot of people do confuse that. Um, they both confuse the place itself. We, we're going to be talking about Antigua in the Lesser Antilles in the West Indies, the Caribbean, and not Guatemala and Central America. And we're also talking about Antigua, which is the same spelling as Antigua. But in my part of the world, the Caribbean, Antigua is the correct mispronunciation of the word. <laughs> um, that is, uh, it was taken from the Spanish, and you know the British usually butcher up language a little bit, so they made it into Antigua. So Antigua is the correct, basically, mispronunciation of the word. Um, so I'm going to do this in three parts, give you a little bit of that history and then talk mostly about my work and show you the photographs and hopefully sell a few books for those of you who love the work and uh, answer questions. Um, so I have, because I have no idea whether people are more interested in the, well, there's another part to this, which are the storms, because I've titled my talk now, it's morphed into uh, Before the Storms. And that means that this work that I did, 1967 to 73, was well before the storms, because I'm referring to the hurricanes of the past of past September. But in any case, the land uh, Antigua was spared, and I'll talk about that in terms of the what happened during those storms further down the line. So, just to let you know that um, starting with pre, well, let me go let. Let me just say that this was uh, is one of the iconic images. It's on the cover of my brand new book, which I have some in the back uh, for sale eventually. But this is uh, an iconic image uh, of uh, English Harbor, which is one of the more famous historical sites on the island. And Lord Nelson, that's the place where he declared the dockyard and fought all of his naval battles. And so the famous Lord Horatio Nelson, this is the famous place. And the image is kind of reminiscent of, you know, Columbus sailing into the island on his second voyage, which he actually did. So that's why I've started with this image, but I'd like to move on to the next image. Is that up or down here? Um, up or over? Down. Down, okay. Ah, just to show you a map of the island. Um, if I stand in the middle, can everybody see one of the other screen? Okay, so I don't have to move to the side. <clears throat> That's a map of Antigua, 108 square. It's an old map. Uh, I think it's 17 something or other. It's the famous ba Baker Jeffries map of Antigua. Um, 108 square miles, about 10, 10 by 12, something like that. You can drive around the whole island in an hour and a half or less. So there were pre-Columbian settlements on the island from 2900 BC. And those uh, various pre-Columbian settlements lasted. Of course, they got dispersed. One Indian group would fight another, and they'd get wiped out. But all the way through to the 17th century. They were pre-agricultural, or what they called archaic peoples. And um, they had various different groups. Saladoid came from Venezuela, the Arawaks. Um, spoke a different language, and then the island Caribs fought the Arawaks, and the Arawaks got wiped out, and the Caribs took over. 
and uh, they raised pineapple, uh, uh, what they call as you know, Antigua black pineapple, which is quite famous, corn, guava, tobacco, cotton. They, they were agricultural peoples, but they also fished th those waters. So um, I'll, I'll tell you the carob story right now because uh, I produced this, the, the Art for the Islands uh, fundraising and relief effort that I got involved in in the last two months since the storms. Um, I produced this poster for the group, Art for the Islands. And the reason that they were so excited about it was that the money from this fundraiser, which we just did this last week, I just came back, and we raised 35,000 US dollars for the islands, for the people, Barbuda and Dominica, um, was for Barbuda and Dominica. In 1970, I took a picture of this little girl in Dominica. That's a long time ago, but she is a pure so-called Carib Indian. Um, She's from the Carib Reservation in Dominica. There's only one left in the entire Caribbean. And um, at the event a few days ago, a Dominican woman came up to me and said, well, you know, it's really a no-no to use the word Carib anymore. Our parliament in Dominica has uh, not outlawed it, but basically said that it's a Western, um, Western uh, expression and that these are the Kalanago people. So theoretically, she said, I'm sorry to see that you put Carib Indian girl on your poster. It should rightfully be Kalinago. So that was a, an interesting, you know, live and learn. Um, so from now on, this will be titled Kalinago Indian girl from Dominica 1970. Where's the word Carib come from? It came from uh, Carib a Spanish word, carabalis, or something meaning cannibal. And that's one of the reasons that the native peoples, the Kalinago, objected to the use of the word because they were described as cannibals, basically, they which they were. <laughs> <laughs> and, and from the research I've done, it seems like they were, but they didn't like, the, the modern generations don't like that description, and I don't blame them. Um, they had other characteristics, you know, but then I guess the word Caribbean came from the word Carib, you know, I mean, voila, there you go. So, they had what? So she was adopted by a Dominican writer by the name of Mrs. Phyllis Alfrey, very, very famous Dominican writer. And I met her at Mrs. Alfrey's house in Dominica, and that's how I made that portrait of her. Okay, Columbus, Christopher Columbus, sighted the island in 1493, and he couldn't settle it because of the fierceness of the Caribs. And so he chased away, basically. And England didn't colonize the island until 1632, several uh, centuries later. And then the people started to raise, of course, sugar cane, tobacco, ginger, indigo, that kind of thing. And so life went on. And we all know about the slave trade, which was developed out of West Africa. 99% of the population of Antigua, and you're going to wonder why these pictures are all of African Caribbean types, that they were all imported in the slave trade right across from the west coast of Africa in the transatlantic slave trade. And so those are the people, the, their, their progeny and their generations come from that group that was enslaved. Slavery ended in 1834, one of the earliest endings of slavery. And um, then we move on to 1967. That's my next sketchy date, um, very sketchy history of the island. But Wikipedia gives a very detailed description. Um, 1967, which was the time when I came to the island, was when they separated. They were no longer a colony of England. They became a statehood in association with England. And then in 1981, they got independence. But to this day, they're part of the Commonwealth of Nations, so the queen is still their queen mother, so to speak. So that's as much of the history I'm going to give you because um, I don't want to you know, bore you with all those details. Does anybody have a question about that part before we launch into my photography and what I did? OK. Yes, go ahead. So on the map you show here, yes. um, 
where was that harbor located? That it yes, it's before? right down here. It's all the way down here. I got to get my glasses on. English Harbor is right here. Falmouth and English Harbor. It's the very southern end of the island, and um, the capital is all the way over here. And but you know, Antigua, if you know, has been described as having 365 of the best beaches in the world, and it's true. It's not fake news, everybody. It is really true. Very, very beautiful, pristine white sand beaches all over the island. You can see from its rugged coastline that it has many, many. I remember when my first husband, who was in Antigua, took me to Antigua for the first summer, 1967, took me to the beach and saw someone walking onto the beach and said, oh, this beach is overcrowded. <laughs> you know, going to the next one, not staying here. <laughs> Okay, so let's see, down. <clears throat> um, I went to, so now a little bit about the history about how I got there. I was a student at Berkeley uh, in um, 1967, and I was finishing, actually it was 1965, now that I think about it, because it was the free speech year in Berkeley. It was a very exciting year to be there. I was finishing my degree, and I met a student who was finishing up his PhD from Antigua. And I love to dance, and he, I, so I met him at a party, dancing party, and um, we got to be friends, and boyfriend, girlfriend, and then he said, why don't you come and see my island, my island, <laughs> and that's, that's how that started. And then a year or two later, we were married, and I have two children who are part Antiguan, and so I've gotten, as a result, completely enmeshed with the island. And the years we, he was a professor at Stanford, in the classics department, that's a whole other story of how an Antiguan got to be a Latin professor. Um, but then we would go every summer, and that's when I started asking the family to drop me in the villages, because I was just starting out in photography, and I was completely amazed by these little villages, you're going to see the shots in a minute, that hadn't basically changed since the slave era. So this gives you an idea of the topography, the, you know, the, that's, that's an old sugar mill. The island was totally uh, sugar. It was sugar cane, sugar cane, sugar cane for years, all handled by the slaves. And so that was a sugar mill that would have had an elaborate wooden mill on top of it, which of course has since disintegrated, but that's the basis of it. And the process of sugar making would go on, the refining of the sugar right there. And then they moved on to a modern sugar refinery, of course, when the mills stopped, when these uh, things stopped. It's one of the beaches that I focused on. It's the only beach on the island that um, comes in in these scalloped forms. That's an amazing Thank you. Thank you. It took some extra technique because it, it doesn't look like it was noon. So this is when I can insert a little bit of my photographic uh, technique. Um, does anybody know what the zone system is? You're all, mostly all scientists here, I assume. There are no poets, right, or no dramatists sitting here. So I assume you're scientists. Do you know what the zone system in photography is? And raise your hand if you do. OK, two out of the group. Um, it was a system uh, invented by Ansel Adams to control contrast on a negative. And it was invented by Herzl and Drexel, so it became known as the H and D curve. The curve revealed how film was developed, when the shadow areas in your film would be uh, developed and when the highlights would be developed and because they came at different times during the 10 minute developing time you could shrink your contrast or expand it once you knew how to meter properly so that I mean I've taught long classes on the zone system believe me it's very complicated so I can't try to get into it here but what I did here was to meter it and develop it in such a way that it made the image look more like moonlight on the water and actually this doesn't oh this is interesting oh no it's the angle that I'm at the monitor okay I'm trying to see how you see that do you see this as very dark uh, shadow yes. and this is highlight the, the two look different. because of the angle yeah. you're sitting at that is um, 
not right. The ones that you look straight on, where the dark and the highlight, shadow and highlights, that's the so way the. Day was it? it was noon. Noon. Okay. Yeah. It was noon, but. What? Um, it's a it's a blow up of uh, a a scene that um, is I, I cropped it. Let's put it that way. So that's that gives you an idea of the image. Um, so yeah, which button is it now? Yes, yes. Please just interrupt. It's such a small group. Yeah. So like, did you take multiple shots of that and develop them at a spread of time? Yeah, because, well, you have 12 exposures. You're not doing the way Ansel did, which he had an 8 by 10 camera. So there was only one single sheet of film in the camera. <clears throat> so I had to figure out how to get 12 exposures in the same normal or normal minus one or normal minus two or normal plus one. So I'd have to do 12 shots in the same situation. This required a normal plus two, I think, because I wanted to expand the highlights to give the idea of that contrast. So I left, I measured my shadow areas, which would have been in here, put them in the right zone so that I would get this detail. I wouldn't want it to go too dark. So I got that, expose for your shadow areas, and then develop out for your highlights. And so you only need one shot if you've got it right. But you have to have the that whole knowledge base about the zone system. Does that answer your question? OK. So, so, More. The, so there were 12 shots. Yeah, well, I mean, there were other shots that I just would let go. But they, were all developed in the same they are developed in the same way, exactly. So, so I'd lose some, gain some, you know. If I was doing a big uh, view camera, I could handle it with one shot only. But So with a medium format camera in which you have those 12 shots, you've got to you got to just make amends. <laughs> Oops, wrong way. OK, so let me just see if this is really the same way. Yes, it is the same kind of contrast. So again, this required this, especially in Antigua and in the tropics, it required this zone system, which, of course, the very first year I photographed, I messed up a lot. And so my teacher at uh, the ASUC studio at Berkeley said, I wanted to let you go. I wasn't going to explain the zone system to you, to a beginner, because it's an advanced idea. And until you go into the field and make mistakes and come back with all these dark faces and bleached out highlights, you're not going to understand. And he was right, because I said, Dave, I'm having a horrible time. The black, they're black people. Their, their faces are going black. And I've got all these screaming sugarcane fields and, and galvanized, you know, roofs. And what, what am I going to do? He said, OK, finally, now you know what. Motivated. What? You were motivated to it. Yes. Then I had, to, well, not only motivated, but I had in my head the reason why I needed to make this shrinking of the contrast. Because our eyes, our eyes uh, just operate in a normal world, if you look at the scene out there, they have the capacity to take in all of these different, uh, uh, what would you call them? What? Textures? No, not textures. High, um, Highlights? Yeah, the, the uh, different tonalities. Um, but, our, but film can't. And pixels certainly can't. OK, so if you want to talk to people like myself of why we stay with film, Continuous tone film does the beautiest thing that we want to happen like this, which digital just won't do for us as well. Let me put it that way. Well, you don't get to see the grain. That's right. You don't see the grain, although if you, you can see, I don't know if they call it grain, you can see the noise. That's what they call it, noise. But anyway, so here was a young girl watching me photograph someone else in the village. And uh, people always ask me if I pose my images, because I do a lot of portraiture. And I just want you to know that this is not posed. I didn't go up to her and ask her if she'd put her arm up there and this arm here, because it was great geometry with this pole here. No. I just turned around 
and there she was. And so the intervention that I do is to go like this. Do you just will you hold that for a minute? And then I work as fast as I can, because that's the way I saw her, and that was her expression was just what it was. Did people ever want not to be photographed? Oh yeah. Yeah, and um, I usually ask, and uh, in countries, as you know, I went on to make another book where the images are from all over the world. It's called Under One Sky. If you go onto my website, um, you can see that, all that work. And so I was in many countries that I didn't speak the language. So in order to communicate with someone, I would just go thumbs up or thumbs down. Basically, would you like your photograph or, or no? And people will let you know right away. And I just back off. If someone says no, I go, OK, OK. You know, I don't need. I don't want bad karma. I don't want to photograph someone who doesn't really respond to me. And I just move on. So that's the way I work. The oh. person is in a very nice pose that you want to capture. Sometimes asking them something, they're going to probably They're going to move. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can sense it, you know, you can, because first of all, if they're going to be hostile and they don't want to be photographed, they're not going to just sit there. And look at you, probably going to move, especially if they see you coming up with a camera. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's a set. I always, in my classes, I always tell students, well, first of all, the class is usually defined people photography when I teach. Because you have to start with psychology when you're working with with people who want to photograph people. It's just not the same thing as photographing still life, photographing trees, all the things that never talk back to you. First of all, you're dealing with humanity, with people who have feelings. You've got to start there and, and analyze your own personality. Or, is this something that I can do well or not do well? How am I projecting myself to somebody? Why are they getting hostile? All of those questions. Uh, come up in a people photography class. So this is an old estate house. I drove by it just a few days ago and it's gone now. An old stone estate house which was actually part of a pineapple plantation. And that's all, what I loved about this was the back lighting and the, the lighting on the palm trees and the stonework the textures and so forth. I'm not really a landscape person. I, uh, these are a few of the landscapes I managed to eke out from my, my proof sheets because my work is mostly about people. This image right now, I have an exhibition in Antigua at a resort called Jumbi Bay, which if you Google it, you'll discover is one of the more luxurious resorts in the world, actually, not only in the Caribbean. And they have placed these, my partner down there, uh, just did a fabulous job of placing these images. This one is like 44 by 44. It's it's like this, the size of that board there. And it's right in their lobby. And it is really, really lovely. And then all these other images you see are 30 by 30, 20 by 20. And the way we did that was to digitize the negatives, the original negatives. Um, so we took all the original negatives, scanned them, made digital files. The guy who does this for me is very skilled. And then he makes digital prints that are absolutely huge. We could do it. We could make gelatin silver prints too. But this is just more efficient. So I was... Um, yeah, I was driving on the Buckley Road in the middle of Antigua and I... There are two occasions, two pictures I found this way by looking at the rear view mirror as I was driving down and seeing that in the, in the mirror and stopping the car and running back with my camera and asking her just to stop. She was walking that way and she didn't move. She didn't, she didn't move. She just, because I just said, please stop it like it, just like that, you know, and move, take it. So, um, what, what do they speak? Oh, English, a pigeon, what? Pidgin English. It's a dialect. Uh, you wouldn't be able to understand it when they go fast, but it's English. But it's got a lot of French words. It's got a lot of African words. It's, it's, uh, it's fascinating to listen to, and the Antiquans talk to each other, because you wouldn't be able to understand it. 
So this is another one I saw through my rear view mirror and stopped and went back to them and asked them just to, they were just sauntering down the road, coming from their ground, you know, uh, when I say their ground, de grong, de grong, that's the Antiguan expression for the ground from not where they live, but to the farm or to their place where they're growing vegetables and they were carrying home mangoes and other vegetables. What? No. <laughs> hardly, hardly. I didn't. I just stopped, you know? And, well, that's the way they would. They didn't tell them what to do. They pose them. They pose themselves. Kids will do that, you know? They'll, they'll mess around with you, which is fun. Yeah. But actually, this part of it is just real. If you were trying to walk down the road with a tin of mangoes on your head, you know? I was thinking of the left. The last one, yeah. <laughs> With the two arms out like that, yeah. Yeah, I agree. The Reverend, oh, by the way, um, is this usually about an hour long in length? Yeah. Okay. Right, I just want to leave some time for questions and sure. some and book and sales. If you want to stay later, maybe it's a silly or Okay, yeah, I'm not in a rush. I just don't want to hold people up. Give a, give a time for people. Yeah, okay, anybody can leave when, a little bit after. when they get, yeah. So this is a, probably my most iconic people portrait photograph. The English harbor scene is my landscape photograph, which, you know, I never made much deal of. I, I, I should tell you that this book is the new book. This is the one that came out in 1973 called Antigua Black. And the reason that I redid that, this one, this year, or just last year, um, is because this one is out of print. And when the exhibition went up in Antigua in, in 2014, everybody came out to the opening, lots of people, and they brought this book with them. And they had never had my signature on it. They were, I mean, really much worse condition than this one. They were, this was gone. This was all mashed up. Silverfish had eaten half the book, you know, stuff all over it, but they wanted it signed. And, um, yeah, the book, is, this book is not available anymore. So they started saying, when can we get a new book? And then I went into high gear and raised the money from some locals who really wanted to see this done and some not-so-local people, too, who live there. Um, America, one American, one Antiguan, and one adopted Antiguan who's from America originally. And they helped me get this one done by one of the best presses in the, in the world, really. An Israeli press does the most beautiful reproductions you could get. So, but I did want to say that Antigua Black was the first publication that came out in 1973. And the Reverend George A. Weston was an iconic figure because way before his time, he was the Black Lives Matter guy. And I did bring an original print to show you just so you get an idea about the way these images are shown in an exhibition. I mean, the slideshow is just impoverished compared to the beauty of a real gelatin silver print. So when you get a chance before you go, you might want to look at this carefully to see the, the subtleties of the way the light and the shadows work <coughs> in the wet dark room, which almost doesn't exist anymore. But um, the interesting part about this image is that well, I don't think I'll go into all that now, how, how it was made with a whole mask in order to get this desk less white, etc. I'm not going to bother with that right now. Anyway, here's the original style gelatin silver print. He, was, um, he went around Antigua and preached that the people should know about their African past that they didn't know anything about their African past. Don't forget when he started, it was a British colony, and the British ruled Antigua. And the people, his people, were all slaves. So he started a school. He started to educate people. He came to America for a while, worked the trains with his wife um, between New York and Chicago, became the vice president of the Marcus Garvey movement, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, and um, then came back to Antigua and started his, his movement of trying to get people to know their own history. And he, there's a monument to him in his house in Green Bay. 
What was the religion there? The religion? In Antigua, it mostly comes down from the English, Anglican, but there's a lot of Methodists and Baptists. And so is he an Anglican? He was a, a reverend in the African Orthodox Methodist Church. African, emphasis on African Orthodox. <laughs> yeah. Kind of a lay reverend, you know. So that gives you an idea of the way the beaches used to look. I was on this beach a few weeks ago, and there's maybe four or five palm trees left. They, through the storms and the um, bugs and various diseases, the palms are gone. Oh, God, I didn't shut that off. Let me just shut this off. Oh, good. Let me put this on mute. Oh. Yeah. So, voila. Yeah, yeah, I forgot. I, I, you know, I told myself, don't forget to turn your, t your telephone off. The previous one, are you on a hillside? Previous one, okay. Um, yes, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. I have on my Hasselblad two different lenses. At the time I had three, but I never used the wide angle. I never liked it. So I had the normal lens, which on a Hasselblad is a 50 millimeter, an 80 millimeter, which is akin to the 50 on your Nikons, and then 150, which is akin to about 105 on the Nikons. So I had a normal lens and a telephoto, one telephoto. No zooms. It's all fixed focal, medium format negatives. The quality of these images, they can go up to this size and they don't fall apart. Young woman in the village. Sorry? Crisp. Yes, crisp. That's an interesting word, yes. It is sharp, very good accutance. Um, so, you know, the Caribbean is famous for its steel bands, and Antigua has a whole thing where in August they celebrate the emancipation of the slaves. And uh, they play the steel bands and they march through the streets. And Juve, they call it Juve Monday, Juve morning. Um, everybody stays up all night and dances and celebrates, and it's, it's their thing. These were bananas in the marketplace that were dumped on the docks from Dominica. That won't be happening for a while. Because Dominica is the island just to the south that you must have heard of, oh, it was completely devastated. But it's also a tropical rainforest. Antigua's dry, has a problem with enough rain. Dominica has 360 some odd inches a year and is a tropical rainforest. So that's the beauty of the Caribbean. You just run into all these different uh, demographics, you know. Um, so these bananas all came from Dominica. So this dude was um, sugar cane, doing sugar cane. And so I was out in the field. I went down one winter in February to photograph the last sugar cane cutting. Beet sugar came in. Sugarcane disappeared, Antigua suffered from a drought, they just couldn't keep it up. So it was the end of sugarcane. Um, so it's one of the last cuttings, and I have some more images. But what's interesting here is that I asked him to push his hat up. Why, after the explanation I gave you earlier? Because with the hat down, his face was in shadow, it was totally dark, and I would have gotten no features on his face at all. Did it grow? Oh, yes. Mount Gay, uh, not Mount Gay, Mount Gay is Barbadian. Cavalier is the uh, Antiguan rum. I don't think you can buy it up here. You can buy Mount Gay, which is from Barbados. Uh, they make wonderful rum, and they drink a lot of rum. Yeah, rum punch, pina colada, all these great rum drinks. So this is another image from the cane fields which when I was in the dark room, I had just passed right by because there was no way that I could get the details on 
her face and on their face. His was fine because he doesn't have a hat on and the sun hit his face. But as hard as I tried, I couldn't dodge enough. If you know enough about the wet dark room, I couldn't keep the light off those faces and still get some good tone in the background. And I just gave up. When we went and did the new book, I just decided, you know, I'm going to give this negative to Gabe, the guy who does the scanning, and let him see what he does. Voila. Look at that. Look at her face. I mean, everything came out. This is, there's some beautiful things about what happens in the digital process that couldn't, I mean, maybe an artisan technician in the dark room could do it, but I couldn't. These are sugarcane shots. Woman in the Village. That became the cover photograph for a huge World um, Bank report on the Caribbean in 19, I don't remember what it was, but uh, it was called the Commonwealth Caribbean, and it was the World Economic Report for the year, and they put her on the front cover. This is Zell. And this is another example of the process, the original little photograph that I made. You can see any of her face. She's just completely silhouetted and no clouds. So there's this dark, dark face with no detail against a sky that has no clouds in it. The digital version, voila. No running water, cart your water, do your washing, scrubbing, rinse it out, hang it out. So this is an image I got from hanging around the village. Does water come from rainwater or do they have springs? Oh, rainwater, there's very little spring water in Antigua. It's very dry. So they have cisterns and they try to save the, the rain. Right. Now they have a few desalinization plants, but I don't think they work very well. So there's always a water shortage. At the Davis family in 67, they had a big sign on their, on the door of the shower, save water, shower with your steady. <laughs> um, because the water supply came on for two hours in the morning, went off all day. And there were horrible political fights about the water getting diverted to the hotels and leaving the people without any water, which was true. You said they did sugar cane. Usually sugar cane is grown where water is very abundant, almost free. I'm surprised sugar cane is grown there. Oh, really? Water shortage. Yeah. Well, but that's why it went out, because of the drought. Okay. <laughs> I guess it probably disintegrated over time or whatever. Yeah. So these kids were dancing to Otis Redding. They had a boom box. I thought I had seen a boom box. I think it's just behind here. Um, playing, sitting at the dock of a bay. And in the book, there's a wonderful foreword by an Antiguan friend who, um, my former husband Gregson did all of the very detailed long text in this book, but in this book, the second one, I decided not to have so much text. So I just have a foreword and an introduction. One by a very uh, prominent curator of Bibliothèque Nationale in France who knows my work and has collected it. And the other by a local Antiguan who teaches um, Africana studies at Brown University. And he has written a wonderful piece about these kids and about other things in the, in the pictures. Still a lot of using use of use of the donkey for moving around. Do they have uh, wild donkeys there? You know what? There was an article that somebody, a friend, sent me just two weeks ago about all the donkeys in Antigua. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I'm sure if when I find it, I'll get you the link and let you know. Wild? I suppose they're mostly wild. Yeah. I know on St. John they had, they had feral, feral donkeys. Oh, yes. <laughs> they live right on Keneal Bay. I remember those donkeys, yeah. Remember the donkeys at Keneal Bay? <laughs> okay, uh, part of what uh, Paget Henry, the professor at Brown, writes about in his essay is about 
this man, who I had no idea who he was, but when he looked through all the work to write the introduction, he said, oh my God, that's Mr. Seeley. He's a joiner. Do you know what a joiner is? Anybody know what a joiner is? Yes? Okay, how would you describe a joiner? Fine, car uh, fine furniture maker, woodwork. And he made all the furniture for Paget's family. And I didn't, he was home from Brooklyn. Oh, the only thing I knew about these two guys is that they said they'd come back for Carnival. They lived in Brooklyn. That's all I knew. But Paget was able to tell me exactly. And that he was a bodybuilder, and all the ladies were in love with him. <laughs> Well, I just got some information two days ago. This was one of the images that I donated to the arts, Art for the Islands. And it got sold to somebody on the island. I don't know who it got sold to, because I left the next day. And my friends, who delivered the print for me, delivered it to somebody whose housekeeper gave me the names of these two people, because she was from this village. So I now know that this is Aunt Lou instead of, I titled it Mother and Daughter. So Aunt Lou and I think her name is Punjan or something like that. I have it written down. The little girl who is still alive now, obviously, she died last year. But it's always great to be able to write something like Aunt Lou and Punjan instead of Mother and Daughter. These are people hanging out on the village steps. And I hung out for a while so that they got very relaxed and forgot about me. You probably can't see this image very well from where you are, but in the book you can. And it's just, we printed a proof sheet of the 12 images and how I would photograph and what else was in the scene uh, around the time, you know, just for fun, to show people what a proof sheet looks like and how you choose images out. There's nothing on this proof sheet that I actually printed up as a final print except this image, which we'll, we'll come to in a minute, which is my Ari Cartier-Bresson moment, the only one I've ever had. <laughs> This is a cane worker, and he's sitting on um, the, the, the carrier, transport carrier, that, where they put all the sugar cane to transport it from the fields to the refinery. Thanks. Those are typical little houses, wooden houses with galvanized roofs, all of which are don't have foundations. I think the fascinating part about it is the way they're, they're just propped up on rocks and built right and sit right on a bunch of rocks. Portrait of a young man in Liberta Village. <coughs> okay, so maybe you guys can see this from where you are. I'm not sure. Does it seem a little strange, anything about it? See, Rodrigo can see it, but I'm not sure anyone back there can see it. Look very carefully. No, it's not that. Yeah, he's holding a Time magazine, and the face is on the magazine. That's not his face. And his cap just happens to be a cap with a, yeah, I mean. That's why I say it's my only Henri Cartier, only decisive moment when you turn around and you see something like that and catch it, and not with the magazine down here or up here, but right in front of his face. <laughs> no, he didn't even see me. He was reading. He was totally engrossed in the magazine. And that the... Um, exhibited government house, there were a lot of people who were able to tell me, oh, because I had just said seen on Market Street. And they said, that's not Market Street. That's South Street, and that's Oscar Mason's nephew or niece, I mean niece, and that's so-and-so and so-and-so, and so I had to change the title again. <laughs> Hello. So now you see that beach in a fuller context where the water was taken. 
but the water wasn't blown up from this negative, or it would have been much less sharp. There was another negative in which I moved much closer, or else I put the telephoto lens on. This would have been a wide angle lens. But that's Curtin Bluff Hotel. It's a very well-known hotel in Antigua, right on the bluff. It's kind of self-explanatory, except the animals are really scrawny. I like that the first one is actually looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For you a bit. Yes. You don't usually get a moment like that when they're looking at you like that. So this is typical village, typical houses, uh, wash basin, no shoes, crates. Okay, let me move along here, see if, uh, I don't know how many more we have. These are schoolgirls in the Foundation Mixed School that's run by the Davis family. So I lived right upstairs, right from where these kids went to school every summer. And the school still goes on. This is one of the few uh, houses left with grass roof. There are not many left like that. Again, the wood right piled on top of the rocks and the grass is used as a roof. This is the game of Wari, which is straight out of Africa and the Middle East too. It's known as Mancala in some countries and Wari in Antigua. And I don't know what they call it. Um, you know, I, it's, it's not an easy, it's, it's a very mathematical game. I don't think it's like backgammon. It has all of its own rules and it's played with Wari, with uh, what do you call it, seeds, little nickels, nickel seeds. Um, you'd have to Google Wari, W-A-R-I, or Mancala. Is what? In India, yeah, I think that's true. It's in India as well. It is a difficult game, isn't it? No, no, no. You count, you learn to count. You start out with equal beads. Uh huh. You pick one up and distribute one. That's right, that's right. And then you pick up. You learn a lot of these numbers. Yeah, yeah. Kids learn counting. That's good. Another schoolgirl. The family includes the donkey, I might add. This is one of the first photographs I took in Antigua. And that little girl who I said with the arms who was watching me work, I was photographing her when she was watching me. And um, I studied photography informally at Berkeley. The ASUC studio had a teacher there, and he was more or less like a, we apprenticed ourselves to him. I was a French literature major. I wasn't, there was no photography major at Berkeley in those days at all. So I went to San Francisco after that. Somebody helped me get into, has anybody heard of the photographer Ruth Bernhard? She's quite a famous West Coast photographer who was a uh, kind of a compatriot of Edward Weston, whom I'm sure you have heard of. Anyway, Ruth, I worked in Ruth's darkroom, and she taught me how to print. And this was one of the ones that where I learned how to print. Oops, wrong one. Seem like very photogenic. Do you think so? Yeah. Or do you well, think it's know, you think it's what I bring to it? At the right moment, they seem very personable. Yeah, most of the time. <laughs> but back in those days, there was also a lot of, um, there was, there were, I had to deal with some hostility and some, you know, a little bit of, well, whoa, 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 what are you doing here? And, you know, you, you they, had. They didn't seem camera shy. Um, the ones who were camera shy are not in my pictures. So basically, the ones that were happy to work with me are what you're seeing. There were um, some people who would ran, ran, run away, and then I'd hear their voices screaming or talking to their husbands or children about what some white woman was doing in the village, you know, with a camera. And, you know, there was some of that, but not a lot. And, sorry? 
Can you speak up? I can't. Aunt Lou. Is this, is this, is this like Aunt Lou? No. But it's not. It's not. Different woman. Mm-hmm. She is a very handsome woman. You wouldn't say she's beautiful, but she's strong. Actually, you played Harry Belafonte's Calypso. To me, all these things are in his Calypso song. Yes, <laughs> yes. The first one, there's a hole in the bucket, Lisa. And I have yeah. Carry me Aki Gold instead, market not a quality would sell. That beat. That's very much a West Indian beat. Yeah. Oops, wrong way. Okay. Oh, we've seen all of those. What's going on here? I'm just doing the wrong thing. Yes, finally. <laughs> so this is the image on the, the back of the book. And actually, um, this image, we just blew up to 30 by 30 for a uh, relief effort in New York for the Mexican earthquake. That's the one they chose for that. I have to stop giving giving prints away. My, my husband says, OK, Margaret, that's enough. <laughs> you know, fortunately, they're, they're, they are also selling as well. I, I do sell the photographs, yes. Oh, you know, 1967, it would be, I can't remember. During the day, though, during the day when we went out to the beach, um, are you thinking about the way it's backlit and everything? Oh, on the tree. Yeah, I don't know if it was high noon or afternoon or what. Can't remember. So this is the last photograph, which is that last year, <laughs> last year the book was presented to Prince Harry for the Jubilee in Antigua, which was the 100th anniversary of, uh, I don't remember what, indep- not independence, uh, what was it? Oh, 50th anniversary of independence, that's what it was. And so uh, Prince Harry was um, representing his granny, the queen, um, because I guess she isn't traveling very much anymore. So we had a special box made by the, uh, the publisher, really cooperated, and within one week, because they decided one week before they wanted this, specially created box that looked just like this, but had a box and a very beautiful printed thing that said, Sir Rodney Williams, Governor General of the Island of Antigua, the nation of Antigua and Barbuda, uh, presents this to Prince Henry, the da 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 of Wales, you know, everybody's name spelled out at length. So this photograph was taken at the, uh, the celebration for the Jubilee. So voila, I didn't get around to talking a lot about how I worked in the villages, but I think, you've, I think you guys got the idea, basically. Any questions, any more questions before we close off? Yes.